on the agenda is uh, the hearing continuation, and we're going to make budget recommendations for uh, Department of Children and Families. So this is a two-year budget. Um, are there any recommendations to finish fiscal year 23? Committee? Representative Clifford. Yes. We're in DCF and... Uh, yeah, fiscal uh, year okay. 23. Which is almost over. I'd like to uh, add a uh, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars enhancement for the Can Coach uh, program. I'm sorry for what? Can Coach. It's on Three Rivers. Uh, it's on. Uh, it's on under the Children's Alliance of Kansas. Last page. Can Coach Supervisor Coaching Program. Yeah, that's a motion, Representative. I believe that's all uh, state we have a second? fund. Yes. Representative Hobbison. Discussion committee. Uh, Representative Carpenter. So just for clarification, this is for 24 or 23? Because, see, we're almost through 23. Yes, it's I, not even going to be to them by you're May. You're correct. Okay. Just, thank you. All right, got ahead of the committee, Mr. Okay. Chair. So your, your motion will be valid for 24? 24. 24. Okay. Let me, let me go back to, let me just go back to 23. Are there any uh, recommendations for 23? Because if seeing none, we'll move on to 24. Representative Clifford, do you want to make a motion then? Uh, gladly, Mr. Chairman. I'd look, like to move an enhancement of 750,000 all state general funds for the CAN Coach uh, Supervisor Coaching Program. Senator Hobson seconds. Committee, do and we have discussion on that motion? Yes, discussion, Mr. Chair. Yes, how, how do we parse that out between state general fund and uh, other? I, I don't have the ability to do that. There's no. Apparently, it's, a, it's all SGF. Apparently. SGF. Okay, stand is moved. And Representative Hobson, you're okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Committee discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Representative Ballard. Yes, sir. For the therapeutic foster care program development, uh, the request was six million. Um, I would make a motion that we grant them the six million. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Representative Ahabasam. Discussion? Representative Carpenter. Wait, and I want to revisit Representative Clifford's uh, proposal in a minute. So go ahead and finish. The oh, okay. All right. Did you hear my motion? All right. It's under Children's Alliance, and we heard testimony about that, the therapeutic foster care program development, and it went on to the next page, and it talked about, so I'm just making a motion that we grant them their $7 million to the DCF budget to fund therapeutic foster care development. Did you say $6 million or seven? Six. Six. And that's all SGF? That's all SGF. For fiscal year 24. Yes. Second. Now, there's a, yes, there's a testimony entitled Children's Alliance of Kansas, and she's talking about page two, about a third of the way down. Six. Committee, discussion on the motion. Seeing none. Uh, Representative Ballard, you may close. I close, Mr. Chair. Okay. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion carries. Uh, let's go back to Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I've been aware that there is um, a 33% uh, federal match available for um, 
the um, proposal that you just made. And so I would ask the representative that he might want to access that 30% match and either subtract the match from it or add to it. And Dylan, what's that figure? I'm sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair. It's 500 and 250 would be two thirds, one third. Mr. Chairman, um, so I've been in com communication with the DCF, so these are not my figures. I want to uh, make that, but we have been looking into this issue. Uh, on the $750,000, they say they might be able to draw down some Title IV e funding in the amount of 16.67%. And so that would be uh, 624,975 SGF and 125,025 you know, other funds, if you want to do it that way. Representative Clifford, um, would you amend your motion to that or? Chairman, I, I would be happy to amend my motion uh, to ref reflect those figures. Okay. And Representative Hobbison? Okay. Let's take a vote on that again. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. <laughs> aye. aye. Opposed, no? Um, the ayes have it. Motion passes. Are there other recommendations for fiscal year 24? Representative Barth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and looking at the program that is the House um, for House of Social Services Budget Committee, I would recommend that we add the 350 for the Kansas Department of Children and Families. Um, this is allowing the Safe Families of Children for Kansas. Um, and really, it would have them also have this available in McPherson, Salina, Manhattan, and Fort Riley. Uh, this is something that I was looking at as a way for prevention of you know needing additional DCF funding as it is actually helping people kids stay in their homes, hoping to avoid the system in general. Is there a page on the budget you can reference? Where is that? Safe Families for Children page here. It's on page three was the, the um, actual amount of 350 towards the bottom. Okay, so their ask was uh, $350,000, is that correct? That is correct. And that is your motion that we add the $350,000? Uh, that is it. For Move fiscal year 24. For the fiscal year 24, I'm recommending the House Social Services Budget Committee add the $350,000 to the Kansas Department of Children and Families for the purpose of allowing safe families for children in Can of Kansas for their programs for McPherson, Salina, Manhattan, and Fort Riley areas. Thank you. May I get a clarification from um, uh, research on is that SGF or is how is that divided? Mr. Chairman, uh, indications are that would not have a match associated with it, and I was going to ask you whether that's SGF. So thank you. So three hundred. Uh, we put that in your motion that three hundred fifty thousand SGF for this program. Um, do you want me to restate the whole motion then with it? No, no, I'm just. Okay, so I would add to my motion that it's out of the SGF. For fiscal year 24, thank you. Very well. Do we have a second? Clifford seconds. Um, Representative Clifford seconds. Do we have a discussion on this committee? Being none, um, I'll have you close, Representative. You want to re renew your motion? You can just say you renew it. I renew my motion. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's much easier. All those, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Committee, other discussion? Uh, recommendations? Recom uh, Representative Ballard. Dollars already in the governor's budget, and they request an additional 216783 Remember, in keeping in mind that this is split between 10 centers, I move that we uh, appropriate an additional $216,783 from state general fund. For fiscal year 24. For fiscal 24. Uh, do we have a second on that motion? Representative Wahabism. 
Committee, discussion? Um, one thing that I, oh, yes, Representative Donahoe. Uh, thanks, so what does that give us? Is that added to or is that just a separate 260? An additional. So is it 400 uh, well, or 32? Well, it would be split between the 10 centers. Okay, all right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Ballard, I was a little, um, I, I missed yesterday and I, I apologize for that. I'm no problem. wondering about the uh, distribution of that to her, $216,000. Is that proportionate or is it evenly split between the 10? What is your understanding? Uh, I'm uh, proportionate by size. Okay, very well, very well. Uh, committee, other discussion? Seeing none. Uh, you wish to close, Representative Ballard? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I close. All those in favor of the motion by Representative Ballard indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion carries. Committee, are there other recommendations for the DCF budget for fiscal year 24? Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, recommend $300,000 from the State General Fund for the Hope Ranch for Women program for 2024. I have a second. Representative Wahabism. Thank you. Uh, committee discussion on that. Representative Carpenter. Wish to further elaborate or seeing no further discussion, Representative Carpenter, you wish to close? I close. Thank you. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Committee, further recommendations on the DCF budget? Seeing none. Oh, Representative Ballard. I had, to, I had to get, I'm sorry, I had to get to where I was looking myself and I was a little bit confused. Um, we heard yesterday from the Boys and Girls Club and um, the role they play in many ways, whether it's after school care and, and everything else. And so in, in looking at that budget, I think they asked for like 1.7, I believe, when I was looking at them. Uh, oh, boy. And it's SGF, because I don't think we have, uh, no, that's out of 10 of funds already in the budget. So I would say seven hundred. And eighty thousand for twenty four. In addition to what's already budgeted? That's already that's in there, yes. And I'm I'm happy to explain more, but I want people to listen first and then I'll explain why. You want people to no, I'm just waiting for a comment. Oh. And I'll be happy to make other comments. Uh, do we have a second on that motion? Representative Hobson, a committee discussion on that motion. It's in the Boys and Girls Club testimony. Page three. Page three. So this is TANF money, additional TANF money. Well, we have TANF money already in there. Um, I would like to switch to SGF. Uh, and part of why I would speak is that TANF funding, we still have money in it, but that's taking a lot out of TANF. But what's already funded for them is out of TANF. And for those of you who don't know, that's temporary assistance to needy families. But I would like to request that the 780 additional come out of SGF. Okay. Committee discussion? Representative Ballard, do you want to elaborate on that? Well, you know, when we look at that is what they're, with all the, what, the 84 clubs that they have around the state, and part of this is the ability to retain staff to cover increased costs for operations. Uh, and so if, when we look at that, it is providing a lot of the child care after school, and we know how desperate people are right now for child care assistance. And I think they do... It's not just a babysitting service. They do additional things in terms of helping their students with after school tutoring and a combination of things. And I think they have really 
worked and there's multiple services. Uh, we know that there's over 18,541 youth being served. Um, and I just think 63% urban, 5% suburban, 18% rural, 15% military. I think based on that, it's a far outreach program. Very well, committee further discussion. Representative Barth. I just had one question, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I remember where she was saying that that was for kids on the waiting list. Do we, does anybody recall how many kids that would help? I, thought, I had it noted it was kids on the waiting list, was what that additional ask was for. May I respond to her? Uh, we, uh, I don't think we got a response because we didn't directly ask that question. But I think by expanding the services, I would hope that that would eliminate part of that waiting list. But part of the waiting list is where they are waiting. You know, it was is it urban? Is it rural? And can they find the people? But partly what she did say was they could hire additional people. And I think that would help. But it's depending on the location. And we did not ask that. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Representative Bowen, please close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I close. You've heard the motion by Representative Ballard. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Motion carries. Yes, Dylan. Just for a point of clarification, I just want to verify that 780,000 SGF. Thank you. Many. Further recommendations for fiscal year 24 for DCF? Representative Clifford. We were approached by Kandra's Children's Service League. I don't did we consider any of their uh, enhancement requests yet? We have not that I'm aware of. Do you wish to? Sure, I would like to ask for uh, 972,000 for fiscal year 24, provide services to additional 775 families. Which one is that? Uh, KCSL, Kansas Children's, Kansas Service, Children's League. Service League. And where on their page are you, are you showing? It's right on, at the bottom of the first page, it was the uh, family, Funding for healthy families expand that service. Okay. And I assume that's SGF? Yes. Or, hang on just a second. Yes. Oh, Jim, I got it. All right, Representative Clifford, your motion is the to uh, add the 972,000 SGF for fiscal year 24 for Kansas Children's Service League. Do we have a second on that? Second. Representative Ballard. Uh, yeah. Could I clarify by my, my motion? Clifford. I've been informed there is a match potential on that of $486,000. The match is from whom? Dylan. Yes, Representative Clifford. It's a federal match, a Family First program, federal match. I didn't do the math on the uh, 972 minus 486, but it's roughly half. Should be about four, 480, you know. All right, so your motion then is uh, we fund Kansas Children's Service League, 972,000 of which 486 is SGF. SGF, correct. All right, and you're okay with that second, Representative Hobson? Committee, discussion? Seeing none, Representative Clifford, will you wish to close? Mr. Chairman, I close. You've all heard the motion by Representative Clifford. 
Uh, those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Committee, further recommendations for DCF? Sure. Representative Ballard. Certainly, if run through the foster care budget uh, and was part of the CCE, uh, I could get a 15.23% match. So that would reduce, you'd still have 6 million, but that would be 5.1 million SGF and 913,000 uh, other funds. I don't think we need to rerun that uh, motion. Okay. All right. Too many other recommendations for the DCF budget for 23, well, 24, I'm, excuse me. Seeing none. Can I, I would entertain a motion to pass out the DCF budget for 23 and 24 as amended. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, I move that we pass out our, oh, I'm doing a blank. <laughs> I was about to go quickly. Uh, the 20, 23 and 24 budget uh, for DCF. We have a second on that, Representative Hobbison. You've heard the motion by Representative Ballard, second by Representative Wahabison. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The budget is passed. Thank you, committee. The next thing on the agenda is a hearing on the budget analysis for KDADS, and I will call Dayton Lemonian to the podium. Welcome, Dayton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, you're now familiar with the budget and analysis document. You should have one in front of you labeled Kansas Department for Aging and Disability Services. We'll begin on page 1154, which is the fiscal year 2023 current year analysis. And I'll give you a second to get situated. We'll begin on page 1154. It says fiscal year 2023 analysis at the top of the page. 1154. All right, Mr. Chair, if I may begin. Okay. At the end of the last legislative session, uh, the all funds amount of $2.7 billion and $1.1 billion dollars SGF was approved by the legislature. Subsequent to the legislative session, there was an SGF reappropriation of $122.8 million, and there was a state institutional building fund reappropriation of $13.9 million. This is where the agency's revised estimate begins. Number three, the first, the supplemental request is to lapse caseloads reappropriations in the amount of 164.1 million, including 63.3 million SGF. This lapses the part of the reappropriation that was associated with the consensus caseloads estimate, and it is lapsed because that's reevaluated in the fall by the consensus estimation group. The governor recommended the addition of 149.6 million, including 18.5 million SGF. This adds in the appropriate of the caseloads estimate from the fall. This results in a total fiscal year 2023 um, recommended amount of 2.8 billion, including 1.2 billion SGF. And I'm happy to stand for questions on 23. Many questions. Seeing none, proceed. Thank you. We can move on to page 1157. It says fiscal year 2024 analysis at the top of the page. The agency has a number of enhancements on this page. I've grouped them by program and I'll provide a little more detail following on a following page. First, this begins from the agency's revised estimate from the previous year. And the first item are enhancements to the Medicaid program, totaling 76 million 
including 30.4 million SGF. Number two, the agency requests 12.2 million, including 11.9 million SGF for enhancements to the Behavioral Commission Program, Behavioral Health Commission Program. Number three, the agency requests 6.9 million, including one or two million SGF for enhancements to Aging and Disability Commission Program. Next, number four, the agency requests 1.4 million all SGF for enhancements to their surveying program. Number five, the agency requests 1 million, including 700,000 SGF for enhancements to the administration program. Number six, the agency requests 8 million, all from the SIBF for enhancements to the capital improvement program. Number eight, the eight in the governor's recommendation, she recommends the addition of 126.4 million, including 53.5 million SGF to, in, to add the fall 2022 caseloads estimate. This is our first estimate for fiscal year 2024, which is why you do not see a deletion above. The governor also recommends the addition of $22 million for emergency um, mental health bed expansion. This is pursuant or related to a spark request for um, Via Christi and Sedgwick County, which does a lot of uh, mental health service in the area, and this would expand their unit. Item number 10, the governor did not recommend a number of enhancements, and this decreases the budget by 66.7 million, including 30 million SGF. Finally, the governor uh, partially recommended enhancements totaling a decrease of 514,000, including 1.5 million SGF. And I'm happy to stand for questions on the general budget before I hop into the specifics. Any questions for Dayton at this point? Representative Clifford. So item nine then has nothing to do with the proposal to have a South Central Mental Health Hospital, just existing facilities and help them with their load? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. That is correct. This is not related to the facility that the Mental Health Beds Committee considered over the interim or the $15 million related to that. This is for the existing Via Christi Hospital to expand their unit. Hello, oh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, is there any money budgeted yet for that facility in the 2024 year or 2025 year? Representative, the $15 million was released by State Finance Council, so that is included in the budget. It's not called out here. Um, it's not an enhancement. It's included in the line at the top, the base budget. So far, we haven't appropriated other money, or we don't anticipate doing that here. That is correct. No money, no additional monies are included in this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? All right, we're ready for specifics. All right, we will turn to page 1164, which lays out the enhancements in more detail. Again, I'll walk through the enhancements for each program and pause for questions at the end of each program. The first program are enhancements to the Medicaid program. The first request is 45.3 million, all funds, including 18.1 million SGF, to add 500 slots to the IDD waiver and 500 slots to the physical disability waiver. The governor did not recommend adoption of this request. The next item is a request for 17.7 million, including 7 million SGF, to standardize rates across several waivers to match the rates on the FE waiver. When those rates were increased, uh, services that are shared across that waiver and other waivers, um, this request would increase the other waivers rates to match the FE waiver for those shared services. The next item, uh, the request is 9.3, and the governor did recommend adoption of that request. And for the next item, the agency requests 9.3 million, including 3.8 million, to increase train traumatic brain injury rehab facility rates. This would double the rates from $700 per day to $1,400 per day, and the governor did recommend adoption of this request. The next item is a request for 3.8 million, including 1.5 million SGF. This would increase the targeted case management rate by 25% from $43 per hour to $54 per hour. And the governor did recommend adoption of this request. I'm happy to stand for questions on these enhancements. Questions committee, Representative Clifford. Uh, I was of course fortunate to be on the interim committee with uh, that uh, 
Representative Carpenter uh, chaired. And I just wondered, uh, it, maybe I would engage you, Representative Carpenter, was there any thought to uh, decreasing the wait list for PD and IDD waiver, or are we just gonna leave that for our future change to the waiver? Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could elaborate, I have a, a budget recommendation ready uh, to go when we do recommendations. That includes the recommendations from the interim committee report it's fairly lengthy, but it basically it includes everything that we agreed on in our final report. There is a phase-in uh, situation on that, which, and I can go into a little bit more detail, Mr. Chairman, if you want. Please, please in do. Ebs, in the absence of time, I can do it next Monday. Or oh, when we make the recommendations. When we make the recommendations, but yes, there is. I, I am going to be carrying a committee uh, recommendation to do the community support waiver, just like the committee, all the work we did all summer, um, will recommend. So I'll be bringing that forward. This is a separate ask by the department. Okay, thank you. He's, he's answered my question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Other questions for Dayton at the moment? Representative Carpenter. So Dayton, this might, you might have to get this to us, but so what does that bring those Ever, the 15 minute rates to, do you have that table? Right. You're asking about standardizing the rates? I am. Um, I'd have to get that back to you, I but get, I'll I provide that I by recommendations. I apologize for nope. lambasting you like that. It's complicated. <laughs> Committee, anything else? Proceed, Dayton. All right, if you'll turn the page, uh, 1165. These are enhancements to the Behavioral Health Commission program. The first request is for five million all SGF to increase substance use disorder Medicaid and uninsured rates. Uh, this would supplement existing funding and it would be used to increase the number of individuals served and to increase the rates paid to providers. The governor does not recommend adoption of this request. The next request is for one million all SGF to expand the ch existing children's crisis respite program. This would allow the um, the pilot program to expand to three to four more programs. The governor did recommend adoption of this request. The next request is for 4.3 million, all SGF, to implement the nursing facility for mental health case management. Uh, and this would maintain the requirements set forth in the pre-litigation settlement agreement. Uh, this was not recommended for adoption by the governor. The next item is a request for 1.2 million all SGF and two FTE positions. This would um, allow the agency to add to one FTE position to serve each of the four casino areas, and it would support their efforts in um, dealing with sports betting uh, addiction. The governor recommended partial adoption of this request. She recommended the addition of the two FTE positions, but she recommended it be funded with problem gambling funds. The next item, uh, the request is 302,000, all SGF, and four FTE positions. This would add uh, FTE positions for children's services and substance use disorder services. The governor did not recommend adoption of this request. The next item is a request for 445,000, half SGF, and five FTE positions to continue funding quality assurance FTE positions. The governor recommended partial adoption she added the funds, but deleted the FTE positions. And I'm happy to stand for questions on these enhancements. Okay, so many questions on those. Seeing none. Oh, Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, so we run into this before, and I'm just gonna editorialize here just a little bit. So you have to wonder, um, the agency asked for these. I'm sure they didn't dream those up. These are folks that are professionals in the field asking for these for our citizens. And so what happens to this is she deletes all that and then we end up being the bad guy because a lot of these services are needed and we end up putting those back in there and then we're called big spenders. So just my own take on that. Thank you. I second that. Any other discussion committee? Representative Barth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I'm just sitting here kind of 
going, I'm shaking my head. I was not in the legislation last year, but you know, I'm looking at the sports betting um, response uh, for positions dealing with the addictions of sports betting. And the way I think I've read the law was written last year and with that passing, we didn't even make enough money to pay for even half of this budget with that law being passed. So to me, this doesn't make any sense just how this is working unless I'm not doing the math correctly. But as of the fall, like I think we only had like 300 or two, like a quarter of a million in taxes that we received. So this would be over a million that they were asking for and then only half of that, we, it hasn't even paid for itself if I'm understanding it correctly and we've done harm. Is that what I'm reading? Comment on that, Dayton? Um, my only comment would be that the, go the agency requested SGF, the governor recommended to be funding with problem gambling funds, uh, which the revenue for the problem gambling funds comes from all of the lottery streams, uh, casinos, traditional. Um, and there is estimated to be enough in that account to fund this at the governor's um, so this specifically says sports betting, not all gambling. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Dayton, what's the balance in our sport in our gambling fund? Uh, it's probably roughly about eight million dollars. I do have that chart. Just one moment. Thank you. Kind of had this discussion in the sports betting deal on the floor last year about a percentage of that going to that, and we found that we have a significant amount of money already in there. Uh, actually, that fund is um, taken from. I, I'm going to leave a. You're up to you. It, it's taken from by a variety of different um, mental health issues and that kind of stuff. So. We do have plenty of money in there, and it's kind of rated from time to time when folks do things. So uh, anyway, what's the balance on that, please? The ending balance in the fund in 2022 was $714,000. Um, for 23 and 2024, the estimated balance is 554000 and then 501000 And that would include the funds for these FTE positions in the 24 ending balance, still resulting in an ending balance of 501000 But how much money have we taken out? I mean, how much money do we get in a year? I suppose that would be the the revenue um, is nine point two, about nine to nine point two million per year. Okay, that's what I'm saying, committee. We it's nine point two million a year that we take in. But uh, they could go down the list. There's a two point five million dollar mental health fund. There's quite a few things out there. Could you? Kind of elaborate on that for us, please. Sure. The expenditures for the fund, and I don't have the specific minute expenditures, but the categories are addiction and prevention services grants totaling $2.9 million in 2022, um, problem gambling services amounting to $210,000 and $400 or $4 million on mental health uh, Medicaid expenditures. Thank you for that. So that's the rest of the picture on problem gambling. Mr. Chairman, to comment? Representative Clark. Uh, and I, I think Representative Bart's point is, is well taken, uh, but I, I, and I almost think this is a mislabeled uh, part in the, the budget explanation because these positions will apply to all forms of problem gambling. It isn't just online sports betting, the way I read the description. And I think when we opened this up last, year, last session, we, we thought, we're not spending enough money on problem gambling. So I'm, I'm glad to see this uh, come in this in the 24 budget. Any other questions? Representative Ballard. Uh, I think Representative Barthel makes a good point, though, because when we were discussing that bill, um, it was always, I think there were feeling that the state was not really Pardon me? Okay. That the state wasn't really making a lot on it uh, with sports betting. Um, I think the feeling was eventually when people got used to it and all, that would increase and we would be doing well. But initially, we are not making that much 
uh, on sports betting, but it's new. You have to remember how new this program is. You know, um, the lottery has been around a long time, but this is new and it was just passed. But I, your observation or your knowledge is correct. We, are, we have a very small percentage for the state. Anybody else hear a ringtone out there? Proceed, Dayton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If you'll turn to the next page, page 1166, we'll move on to enhancements, enhancements to the Aging and Disability Commission program. The first item is a request for four million all funds, including one million SGF, to implement a fully automated care system, which is used to assess the placement of an individual in a long-term care facility. The governor does recommend adoption of this request. The next item is a request for 1.8 million, including 470,000 SGF, and this would increase the care rate per assessment. The governor does not recommend adoption of this request. The next item is a request for 500,000, including 250,000 SGF, for a contract to survey the IDD waiver population regarding providers. The governor does not recommend adoption of this request. And the final item is a request for 500,000, including half SGF, to continue fi funding seven um, final settings compliance FTE positions. And the governor recommends a partial adoption of this, adding the funds, but not the FTE positions. And I'm happy to stand for questions on these enhancements. Many questions on those. Seeing none. Then I'll move on to the next page, page 1167. These are enhancements to the Survey, Certification, and Credentialing Commission program. The first item is a request for 290,000 all SGF to increase base pay for this program staff. The governor does not recommend adoption of this request. The next item is a request for 12 FTE positions, including um, and 1 million all SGF to add to those 12 uh, FTE positions. And the governor does not recommend adoption of this request. And I'll stand for questions on those enhancements. Any questions? Seeing none. All right, we'll move on to page 1169, which are enhancements to the administration program. The first request is for eight FTE positions and almost 800,000, including half SGF, to fund uh, those eight IT support FTE positions. The governor recommends partial adoption, approving half of the funds and half of the FTE positions. The next request is for 250,000 and 188,000 SGF and two FTE positions for attorney FTE positions. And the governor recommends partial adoption, approving one FTE and half the funds. I'll stand for questions on the administration program. Many questions on the administration program. Seeing none. Excuse me, uh, Representative Barth. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you help me just understand, are we talking about 12 FTEs on this enhancements for the 290,000 being that each employee would make on average 24,000 more per employee? Is that what I'm reading there? Uh, the math? I would have to do the math, I'm not, that great at math, I use Excel a lot. Um, but the 12 FTE positions and the associated funds, the 1,059,000 would be for the salaries and wages for those FTE positions. Okay, I just took the 290,000 divided by 12. Um, sorry, those are for, uh, those are not for the same FTE positions. The 1,059,000 would be the funds for the 12 FTE positions and the Number one, the base pay for the staff would be for uh, positions across the program beyond the 12. Thank you. Any other questions? What else do you have for us? I'm on the final program, page 1170. These are enhancements to the capital improvements pro program. The first item is a request for 2.8 million all state institutional building funds or SIBF for remodel and renovation projects on Osawatomie campus. The governor does not recommend adoption of this request. The next request is 556,000 all SIBF for raising projects. 
the governor does not recommend adoption of this request. And finally, the agency requests 4.7 million for priority two rehabilitation and repair projects, which are included in the five-year capital improvement plan. The governor does not recommend adoption of this request. And I'm happy to stand for questions on that program or the budget as a whole. Okay, committee, questions on that program or the entire budget? Nothing? Representative Clifford. Again, I, I'm sorry to put my uh, colleague, uh, Representative Carpenter, on the spot constantly, but um, back on page 1167, uh, I thought we really wanted to fund this survey of the IDD waiver population because we, you know, after some people are on that list 10 years, we have no idea who's really still out there. Representative Carpenter. We need that money. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what that is. We'd have to talk to the agency about that, but I do know that we funded a $5 million study with KU Med Center to study the wait list and make it real time and, and a bunch of other things like that. So I'm really not that concerned about that, but I, I, we'd have to ask the department exactly what what they meant for with that. Thank you. Dayton. Um, I did clarify this with the agency. The So the study that you're referring to was funded with the 10% HCBS FMAP enhancement and it's through KU, with KU. This is a separate um, survey, which would survey, uh, to my understanding, satisfaction with providers as opposed to the other study, which is serving those on the wait list. Although, if I'm wrong, they will correct me shortly. I'd like your answer. Stick to it. Thank you. Uh, committee, final questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Dayton. So at this point, then, I would call Secretary Howard forward for her testimony on KDADS. Welcome. Again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Glad to be back with all of you to talk about the KDADS budget today. Um, I will skip some of these pages just because when we did an overview with the committee, we talked about some of those, but I, but I will stop on a couple just based on some questions that already came up. So um, again, just as a reminder, um, you know, KDADS has um, major program areas in behavioral health, long-term services and supports, our survey certification and credentialing, and our state hospital commission, as well as our administration. Um, I might, just on um, page four, um, I, I'm not going to go over each of the program areas, but um, I may stop to highlight um, anything relevant um, in terms of some of the priorities. So again, you see some of the priorities within behavioral health, the, the work to enroll and certify um, the CCBHCs, um, the KBC um, Youth Children's Hospital that's just recently opened in Hayes, um, as well as the work that's been happening along the 988 plan um, with the resources you supported last year. Um, I did want to stop on page, um, let's see, on page seven, the long-term services and supports. I think a couple questions just came up there. One, just about the survey that we had requested as an enhancement. That is a separate survey. Um, we requested state general fund in the budget. That is a survey related to um, existing clients. It's kind of done nationwide. Um, that was not recommended in the governor's budget, but through some recent funding through the SPARC committee, um, one of the categories was a modernization category. Um, that's been administered by the Department of Administration. They recently awarded us funding to pay for that for two years from that funding. So um, again, so that, that would no longer be needed through this process. Um, I might, I might also, just as a quick update related to um, the Sedgwick County and the, the hospital funding, um, you know, as you recall, um, last year the legislature um, created the Special Committee on Mental Health Beds. Um, $15 million that was in the budget last year um, was reviewed by that committee. The State Finance Council released that funding in December. 
Um, and we are in the process of talking with Sedgwick County about an agreement with them um, for them to then begin um, looking at kind of an RFI or RFA um, process around, around site selection and things like that. So we're well underway with that. Um, there will be additional funding connected to that project, um, likely through SPARC funds. We as an agency will be managing um, one of the buckets of funding that was approved by um, the SPARC committee and the Finance Council at the end of the year. Um, and the Sedgwick County will, um, will apply for a portion of those funds. Um, so again, more to come on that, but nothing um, within this budget that we're requesting from any state dollars. Um, if I move maybe more specifically into the budget, um, I'm going to skip over some of the 23 um, bar, bar, bars and bar charts, pie charts and things like that. And, and I'll skip over to um, page 16. Um, again, just as with DCF, we wanted to give you just a quick overview of the COVID-19 federal funds that have come directly to the agency. These are things that have come to us through the Administration on Aging or from SAMHSA at different points during the pandemic. Um, so you can see a total of award, awards of about $68 million. Um, and we still have a, a couple of years to expend down um, some of those resources. Um, so again, you can see everything from um, congregate meals to crisis intervention services related to mental health to some additional funding we passed on to the state's long-term care ombudsman office. So again, some of the targeted resources um, that have come through. Um, and then on page 17, um, the largest tranche of um, uh, federal funding kind of coming out of the pandemic, the 10% FMAP enhancement, um, whereby the state State, um, will draw down over this entire period of time about $93 million in additional federal match for HCBS programs um, for which we're then required to reinvest the state funds. Um, those of you on some of the other committees have heard this quite a bit, but the largest expenditure we've made from that was about a $50 million expenditure that was around workforce and direct service workers for recruitment and retention bonuses for direct service workers. The waiting list study that you referred to is underway. Um, we have some projects related to um, study and design of a career ladder for di the direct support workforce, um, um, an RFP related to employment first in terms of, of employment disability services. Um, we still have um, probably about 13 million or so unallocated, but we're looking at perhaps around 10 million of that towards technology support kinds of projects. Um, um, and, and or the potential of, of funding from that going towards um, any development costs connected to the community support waiver should that move forward. So um, page 24, page 18, um, just a, a couple of quick charts about the KDADS budget. Um, our total budget for state fiscal year 24 recommended by the governor is just under $2.9 billion. Um, so pretty large agency there. Um, we're a very large Medicaid agency. Um, if you look at that very next page, um, the state and federal funds going to Medicaid funded programs in our budget is $2.5 billion. So not as much as you saw in KDHE, but certainly um, we are a major partner in the Medicaid program. Um, I will skip over and get kind of into the focus part of the budget. Um, again, on page 23, as Dayton indicated, um, we had no adjustments to our budget, no supplementals, um, no adjustments except for the, the caseload adjustments. Um, in fiscal year 24, the governor recommended 11 enhancements um, for KDADS. Um, that we're very grateful for that total um, just over 60 million um, from all funding sources, 37 million out of the state general fund. Um, and then in addition, um, caseloads were also, um, of course, adjusted in the, in the recommendation as well to reflect the November caseload estimates. 
So I, I just wanna talk briefly about those enhancements. Um, there's a table on page 25 and 26, and then I have a page that describes each of those. Um, the first one um, was an enhancement for seven FTE positions for some of the compliance and monitoring oversight that we have to do related to what's called the HCBS final settings rule. And, and that's a requirement that's been placed on stage to assess and evaluate every provider with regard to whether or not individuals have opportunities for community inclusion. It's been a very um, intensive project. Um, to reduce the impact on state general fund, we, we initially funded those positions with the 10% FMAP. Um, we put off asking for general fund as long as possible to reduce that demand. Um, but we, w that funding will be going away, so the governor has recommended um, the conversion of those costs to state general fund beginning in fiscal year 24. Um, um, we actually have a, a site visit from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services this spring to look at a number of settings in our state and look at um, the level of compliance. This has been a major effort over, uh, over a few years now across the country um, based on um, federal requirements and what was a, a federal rule called the final settings rule. Those of you on the Bethel Committee have heard about this for probably three and a half years now. Um, the, second, um, the second item that the, that the governor recommended, which is also in the staffing area, is um, five FTE positions in the Behavioral Health Commission um, related to quality assurance. This is another circumstance where in association with um, the um, Increase of the the increased work related to certified community behavioral health clinics and a pre-settlement agreement that um, we've talked with you all about that we entered into related to nursing facilities for mental health. We needed additional quality assurance staff. This is another one where we put off the state general in, general fund impact as long as possible by funding that with some of those COVID-19 public health emergency dollars I talked about earlier. Um, the availability of that funding will end, and so the governor's recommended the conversion of that to, to state general fund. Um. Um, on page 29, um, the governor's also recommended an enhancement for four additional IT positions um, in KDADS. Um, I mean, I just have to say, one of the first things I noticed when I came into um, the agency as a secretary was how under-resourced the agency is um, on the IT side of the equation. Um, how um, how ancient the technology is, um, the lack of IT staff to provide support, and some of the critical support even as we think about the infrastructure across our four state hospitals as well. So I think we had asked for eight FTE. The governor graciously um, afforded us four FTE in our budget. Um, again, with all of the focus on um, IT security and those pieces and with systems that are pretty dated. These are, these are really, really critical, critical resources for us. On page 30, um, another enhancement the governor recommended relates to um, the care and pass our assessments that are done before people um, enter nursing homes. Some of you probably have um, heard conversation about this over the last few months um, of a backlog that we've had in those. Um, I think we've responded to some um, you know, constituent inquiries you brought in. We've reported to the Bethel Committee. We've made some good process in that backlog, but it's a very... Um, let's say, unautomated process. It's a process where, where assessments are being faxed into us, literally, um, you know, and just hundreds and hundreds and thousands a year. So what this would do, this is a um, uh, um, funding of four million dollars, one million state general fund, remainder from Medicaid dollars, that will allow us to automate that entire process. Many states have automated that process whereby, um, you know, facilities can, um, enter that information um, automatically. The review can happen um, through that automated system. And so again, we're really excited about the ability to modernize this. I mean, not only will it save um, my team a lot of efforts, it'll save um, you know, nursing facilities and hospitals across the state lots of time and effort. Um, so again, we've already begun the process with our Medicaid partners and have received approval from the Federal Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to 
draw down this kind of matching fund. So again, um, this would require one million in state journal fund um, to really modernize um, that system. Um, page 31, you already had some conversation about this, um, which would be um, an enhancement of some of our work in the problem gambling area. As, as Dayton indicated when he talked about the spending from the problem gambling fund, we really have a very small program right now, um, can do very little um, in problem gambling. Um, there, in fact, a couple of years ago, you also passed a bill that put some priorities on spending from that fund um, to be focused um, first on problem gambling before on some of those other things that Representative Carpenter talked about. And the governor's recommendation really kind of stays true to that legislation that, that also passed. Um, it would allow us funding to um, really update our public awareness campaign, um, to get a lot of information out there about the resources that are available to people through the helpline, the treatment services that people can access that we, that we fund and support, as well as providing us two additional positions. Um, we have two staff right now associated with this. This would allow us to have one staff connected to um, each of the casino areas. Again, funded entirely from that problem gambling fund. Um, page 32, um, the governor has recommended an additional attorney um, within KDADS. Um, this actually was a recommendation that came out of um, uh, some, consult, some consultants that we had hired a year ago um, related to Larned State Hospital. So the position um, would function under the direction of my chief counsel. We would do a lot of work um, related to, um, to Larned State Hospital, um, the SPTP side, the forensic side, and then provide some backup areas where we also have quite a bit of backup as it relates to regulations and, and, and litigation. So again, one, one additional attorney position. Um, starting on page 33, um, there are three enhancements um, that relate to long-term services and supports. Um, the first is that TCM rate increase of a 25% rate increase. Uh, again, this was talked about quite a bit during the Bethel Committee. You'll hear this again when you have public testimony um, that maybe the 25% isn't enough. Um, but in any event, we're very pleased to get the, the governor's recommendation for a 25% rate increase. And I think a context piece that is important, when, when this legislature gener generously recommended increased funds last year for the IDD waiver, you know, substantial investment in that waiver, um, TCM was left out of that because it's a state plan service. So this isn't like coming back for an additional increase. Um, they did not receive that increase. Um, and they're challenged as are others to, um, to kind of maintain their providers and provider network. The second area in long-term supports and services relates to um, an increase in the rate that's paid for brain injury rehabilitation facilities. This isn't the waiver. This is for the actual you know, hospital-based setting that people first go to after there's a brain injury. The governor's recommendation would double that daily rate from $700 per day to $1,400 per day. Um, we are very concerned with keeping open the singular facility that we have in Kansas. Um, the rate that we've been paying clearly doesn't meet those costs. We also would like to be able to recruit um, you know, others to provide this service in Kansas so that individuals who have a brain injury don't have to leave the state for that first immediate intensive of rehabilitation that they go through before they might go on the waiver. Um, so again, um, really needed, um, you know, certainly to retain our existing provider, but also if we were ever to increase the capacity for what we call these birth beds within Kansas, it's important to have that Medicaid floor rate at a level that um, can um, be closer to meeting those costs. And then the last one on the HCBS that I think Representative Carpenter was asking about was the rate standardization um, to the FE rate. And we do have a chart that we'll provide to, to um, Dayton um, and to the committee that details, um, you know, for either the 15 minute increment or the hour or whatever the level is, what that increase is on each of the waiver. We, we already have that representative. So we'll make sure you all get that today. Um, Again, that's, um, that's again trying to bring those back up and not have the waivers kind of competing with each other for those direct care um, workforce.
I'm almost almost finished here, representatives, Mr. Chairman. The next area is in behavioral health services. The governor's recommended a million dollars SGF in fiscal year 24 to expand um, what we've successfully piloted last year through what we've called a children's crisis respite program to additional communities. Um, these, these really would provide respite services for children with severe emotional disturbance to, to, to receive kind of a short-term short residential stay that's close to home. Um, you know, these are youth who don't need the level of care of psychiatric residential treatment facilities, but their caregivers may need, may need um, respite. These could be biological caregivers, these could be foster parents, um, and there may just need to be kind of some short-term crisis care. Um, we've already funded a program here in Topeka through um, Family Service and Guidance Center, and um, there's also a program out in Garden City, and we've had some um, interest as well from Fort Scott. This would allow us to um, fund three or four more programs um, for startup and operational support across the state. Um, page 37, um, this is um, emergency um, bed expansion for um, behavioral health. As, as Dayton indicated, this is targeted uh, specifically to the Ascension Via Christi St. Joseph's campus. And this would um, actually allow them to expand their um, emergency room capacity by 20 beds. And your slide should say um, 49 beds um, instead of 40. Um, and it's, I think one of the pieces that's really important is just kind of the scope of where they, um, where they receive um, consumers from. It's certainly not just Sedgwick County. It's, it's dozens of counties around that area. Um, the governor did put a proviso um, in the budget um, that if any funding comes to them through the SPARC process, you know, there's some RFPs that'll be opening up, that, that, that we would certify that to the budget office and the SGF would go away. So so any portion of it would go away if any portion of this were funded through the SPARC process. So I think that's important to know as well. Um, the remainder of the document, Mr. Chairman, is kind of some caseload summaries, kind of just gives you some, um, some charts in terms of the average people who receive our services and some of our um, performance-based budgeting. Um, um, measures. Um, I won't go through those, um, but I'm happy to, to um, answer any questions about those or anything else. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, committee, what questions do we have for the Secretary? Representative Ballard. Just because I was on 37 and you just covered it about uh, Via Christi St. Joseph campus, you said change it to 49 beds? Yes. The additional 20 beds would be designed for behavioral health and to enhance. Is that, are they designated emergency room beds, or is there a wing for that in a hospital? I mean, tell me more about that, please. Yeah, this is really letting them do an expansion of their emergency room and then to create kind of specialized wing, wing of that emergency area related to behavioral health. Uh, I mean, they, they have significant demand there, um, um, and this would allow them to do that. Um, it, they, they play a really critical role in terms of um, support and stabilization um, on the behavioral health side. And as, and as I said, and as, and as you can see on the chart, really for a number of counties across the state. Um, so, um. I would comment that is really needed because, you know, I'll just use the example. I know hospitals that had wings and then they closed them and so therefore you, do, there, you don't have emergency available for people that need help right now. They can't wait till tomorrow morning or two mm -hmm. days from now. They, they, they have to have it right now. And I think that's what a lot mm -hmm. of Kansans and constituents and parents and other people have been really concerned about what's available if they need help right now and how can you isolate them before they do harm to themselves or others. Yeah. Yeah, and this really is targeted towards their emergency room. They obviously have longer term beds in that hospital um, as a psychiatric um, facility. Um, but yes, um, that, that was the request, and that's what the governor's recommendation would do. And again, contingent upon the state journal fund being contingent upon um, whether they receive any funding through some of this SPARC RFP process. So. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Hobbison. 
Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for your presentation. I'm just going back to slide number 32, doing your enhancement. Uh, you did say that uh, based on a uh, recommendation consulting, you guys added uh, an additional attorney. Now, are all your attorneys like centered in one location, or are they throughout the state? Is, is there like a is there? Um, we we have we have attorneys that are that are actually located in some different places. Um, most of them are centralized here in Topeka, um, but they travel a lot to the state hospitals. And then we have a few um, now that their workstation is actually outside of Topeka. I mean that was that was more from the hiring perspective um, than anything else. Um, and, and especially if they were doing work like connect to our hospitals, there's no reason for them to be in Topeka all the time. I'll just, oh, if I, can. Yeah. I didn't know if, you, if it was, you know, if you had like offices like in Wichita, well, well they operate out of your, your, your um, legal. We, yeah, you know, unlike DCF, you know, KDADS is primarily in Topeka, except for our surveyors. Um, and many of our surveyors, there are, there are a few KDADS offices across the state where they house in, or sometimes they might house in a DCF office or an office of another state agency. So, um, so the attorneys we have that aren't in Topeka, um, they have the opportunity to have a, to have a base or a, an access to an office um, either through a KDAS facility or through one of our partners. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, committee, I might bring your attention to in the budget from um, page 1176 to 1177. You'll spend $60 million on that page. It's the Department of Aging with very little explanation about actual spending or anything, but what I really want to talk about is senior, uh, the nutrition program. So where are they at? I know last year they received a lot of federal funds. The last couple of years they had $13 million balance last year. So where are they in, in, in that funding? You're, that, that's correct, Representative Carpenter. Um, there has been a, some additional funding that has come in for nutrition. Um, the, the page in, in my, my document that talked about the, the COVID funding um, certainly has um, some things um, identified there. Um, so on page 16, you can see that um, it was about 13.8 million that um, came in related to um, meals and nutrition for seniors. I mean, they'll be spending that down over this year. You also funded some resources directly to nutrition providers, um, not through the, the AAAs last year. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think what I would say is the enhanced kind of funds that they had are going away. So they, they would really be getting back to kind of that more status quo. Um, I, I. I don't have a lot of details on um, wh where where they may see the needs are. I mean, I'd be happy to do a little bit of work and get back to you on that representative. I think you'll probably also hear some public testimony on that. Exactly. So that money is going away. And then in the governor's budget, there's an, a decrease in funding on, on the page there of the $60 million funding. There's a decrease. So... It doesn't look like to me we're going to replace that, or at least it's not in the governor's budget where we're going to replace that money. And I know for a fact that those, new, those senior centers that provide meals are in a, a world of hurt, and it's not addressed, in at least, and I can find it in this budget. And I'd like to have answers for that for the committee, if you would, please. Uh, sure, that'd be fine, Representative Carpenter. That's right. There's not an enhancement in this budget. Um, you know, I think during the course of the last few years, we had the enhanced federal funds. As those go away, um, the impact of inflation and those things um, impact our nutrition providers and our AAAs as much as anyone else. So we'll bring back some information for you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I continue? Yes, please. Thank you. And committee, I don't mean to belinger this. Okay, so um, PACE program. So the way PACE is funding, it's actually funded on nursing home uh, occupancy. So nursing home occupancy is going down. So PACE program funding is also going down. It's kind of a reverse deal. I know they're in caseloads now, but that's still not making up that difference. So could you explain to me how that's going to work and, and what we're going to do to stop that or keep that? Yeah. Thank um you. 
Yeah, I think what Representative Carpenter is talking about, and if I flail too much, I might ask Brad Ridley to come up here. Actually, maybe I might do that if you don't mind. Let me, if I could ask Brad to explain the funding and also maybe an option or two that we think um, are feasible that we've been talking with the PACE community about. Um, so, Brad. Uh, Brad is our Commissioner of Administrative Services, Brad Ridley. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. Um, so, so PACE rates, and I'll try to keep it high level, um, but essentially what we're required to do when we set a PACE rate is we have to set that at a discount of what would otherwise be paid in general Medicaid. So the same populations, which for PACE, the equal populations are nursing facility, the frail elderly waiver, and the physical disability waiver. So really, when we set those rates to get approved by CMS, we have to set that at a discount of what we would pay if those individuals were on can care. So that's really at a high level how those rates are set. Whatever the, that average cost is on the can care side, we have to set that at a discount. Today, that discount is 10%. So whatever that cost is on the can care side, we set the pace rates at 10% less than that. So there's, there's a 10% window um, that we've been talking with the PACE providers about that without even rebasing, that there's some flexibility in there to increase that PACE rate. Very good. Thank you for that. And if I might, Mr. Chair. So for the committee's benefit, and, and PACE is to keep folks out of, in their homes and out of nursing homes. And this committee has been very supportive of that concept. And I think it's saved us a lot of money over the years. And, and more importantly, it's increased the quality of life for folks because they've been able to stay in their home. So that's kind of important. May I have one more question? And then I'm done, I promise. So I don't see much in here about nursing homes. So um, I know in the governor's budget, there's a full rebase. In the governor's budget, there's a in caseload, a fall caseload, we included a 5% increase. Right now, we're estimating what a full rebase would cost is just under 10%. So the governor's budget has 5%. The rebase is estimated at close to 10%. So committee, just to explain that to you, in law and statutes, I think it was in 2007, we passed a law and it's in statutes, which we rarely have fulfilled that. I think last year was the first time that we ever did it fully funded the 3% increase that we're supposed to, or the rebasing. So every year we rebase on actual costs and then we figure out what we owe the nursing homes and then we add that to that. So that's what we call rebasing. It's a, it's a process. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's it. That's basically what you've proposed for nursing homes is a 5% rebase when we should pay them 10. What was agreed in the fall caseload? You know, again, that agreement between the legislative staff, the division of budget and our agency was a 5% um, increase. So, and, and as Brad indicated, um, the, the estimate to do the full rebasing would probably be just about double little over double what's in the recommendation right now, so. And that's in the governor's recommendation, so. The 5% is in the right. governor's recommendation so through the caseload make, process. To make us comply with the statutes that we have in our books, we would need to increase the nursing home rebasing fee by 5%. That's right. I mean, as you know, Representative, typically there's like a proviso put in the appropriations bill that says, you know, notwithstanding the statute. Um, um, so, so again, yeah. Yeah, factually, there's a 5% increase in. The cost to do the rebasing called for by statute would be just over 10%. So, and we have those numbers. We can share those. Um, sure yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, Representative Ballard. In that again, because I saw some blank faces here, and I don't know as I can really explain it well. Again, would you explain rebasing? Yeah, I'm going to ask Brad to explain it, if you don't mind, Representative, because I think he can probably say it in a clearer way than I will. Um, so I'm going to to explain it. It's like I I can see it, but I can't explain it because re rebasing is not easy. Okay. Right. No, it's very very complicated. So I'll try to hit it 
also like PACE at a high level. So essentially nursing facility rates, we get a cost report every year from every nursing facility that identifies with the cost they spent in that previous calendar year. So cost reports will be coming in, are coming in now due by the end of February for 2022 calendar year. So we get those cost reports, they get cranked through uh, calculation. And when we talk about rebasing, the rates are set based on looking at three years of those costs. So looking back at three years, and we talk about rebase, it's rolling that year forward. So we grab that last, last uh, most recent cost report year. So rates that we have today um, are set based on 19, 20, and 21 calendar years costs of the facilities. And once those costs are calculated, there's um, adjustments for inflation to um, leading to the midpoint of the next calendar year, of the next fiscal year. So, so it looks at those nursing facility costs. Each nursing facility gets their own individual rate based on their individual cost. Yes. So there's no, there's no standard. You do it based on the individual nursing home, what their costs, what their expenses might be, instead of all of them fit like 10% everybody across the board. We don't do that. And see, that's what makes it really complicated because when you put it all together, you could have 23 nursing homes and yet you have a different percentage or base. Am I correct? Correct. That's set by CMS? Um, it's set by our methodology that is approved by CMS. So we, we explain to CMS every year how we set those rates that they approve and they approve that methodology. Now that helps me. Okay, thank you. Sure. So, so this is a per capita cost, or I, I mean per resident, or, or is that what you're saying? I mean, it, it's a facility level cost. So, looking at those costs for each individual facility, there are adjustments for acuity um, that are made once in the year. Um, so, there's adjustments if there's a change, higher acuity in a facility. There's some adjustments made for that. This is the total dollar amount it took our facility to operate this last year. Correct. What happens to the 5%? What does that 5% mean? So, so what's in the budget today what is 5%. So what, if, that's, if it remained that way, we would work with the associations, the stakeholders, um, to figure out how to apply that 5%. Would we do a partial rebase? Would we do a 5% across the board um, if, if there was not a fully funded rebase? We, we would look, work with the stakeholders on those different options. Representative Barth. You have nothing? Okay. Uh, committee, other questions? Representative Clifford. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, I want to go back to the mental health facility in uh, the Sedgwick County area. Representative uh, Wahabson and I attended a meeting at lunch with five of three of the five uh, Sedgwick County commissioners. and. And I'm really glad to see, you know, the conversations ongoing. Um, I left that, uh, and Chairman uh, Dennis spoke at length about the facility, um, and they're really pleased how this is working with the state, but they intend to build it and then let it be state owned and run. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was left that meeting thinking they needed something from us in the legislature to take the next step to get to the RFI or RFP, but, uh, what, what is your understanding of it, Madam Secretary? Uh, you know, I don't think they need anything from the legislature per se. Um, we're, at, we, since the $15 million was released that was approved last year to KDADS, we need to enter into an agreement with them to do that. And um, I think that's prop might be what they were referring to. I'm gonna ask um, Deputy Secretary um, Bruner, I know he was at that meeting as well. So. Scott Bruner, Deputy Secretary, um, that, that what the Secretary said was right. We need, sorry, we need, um, we have the $15 million to spend to start on planning and design and, and potentially into construction. Um, as we've been talking with the Cedric County uh, team, they would like to lead the process of the design and de development of the, the needs assessment, the kind of what the building might look like, how many rooms there are, what standard they need to be built to, that kind of um, design document work. They have um, con uh, architects on contract that, with the county that could do that, that work. So we need an agreement with them so we can send 
some of that $15 million to them to start that, that process. I don't, I, like the Secretary said, I don't believe we need any additional help from, from the legislature in terms of a statute or anything to, to make that happen. Um, we just need to get that, that agreement executed and it's in process. Thank you. I, it seemed like site selection was going to be a really big thing. So, uh, but the agreement first and then it will release money and they can do the business. I, I can't um, say, Representative Clifford, how far that agreement will go. Uh, I know we want to get the first step of the design work done. And so the first, this agreement might just cover that part of it um, with the funding attached. Um, when we get into site selection and some of the RFP work that does, that's a little more complicated um, between the state process and what kind of governs when we acquire or build a building and what the county has. We'll, we'll work through that. So I don't know if that'll all be in this first agreement, but, but we're definitely taking, taking those steps. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, if you hold just for a second, Madam sure. Chair. Good. All right, thank you for that uh, opportunity to have a sidebar there. Committee, other questions for the secretary? Seeing none, thank you for your appearance. Thank you. So, committee, assuming that we have a meeting tomorrow and we don't get uh, snowmageddon, we'll, uh, we'll have public input. And right now we have a lot of public input. We'll try to get through as much of it as we can tomorrow. Uh, we may have to hold some of it over till Monday. And we'll go from there. So, meeting is adjourned. Oh, represent. Oh. Dayton has something he wants to say. I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have the follow-up information regarding the FE waiver rates for the other for the other waivers. If you wouldn't mind me distributing that. Rep uh, Representative Carpenter asked about the wa yeah. waiver waiver rates. Okay. Forget I said it. Meeting adjourned. That's all I have. So I I'll take that back. <laughs> Is there an explanation on this, or is it just passing out the information? Sure. Um, before I explain, I would note one error on the last line. Okay. Uh, the 96.65 should be 93.65, and the 11.52 should be 8.52, uh, so off by three there. Um, these are the services that are offered on waivers other than the FE waiver. When the FE waiver rates were increased, these rates were not increased, even though they're offered on all of the waivers listed. So this uh, is pursuant to that enhancement to increase these rates on the waivers other than the FE waiver to standardize them. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Committee, are there questions on the, the sheet that Dayton handed out? Seeing none, thank you. Now committee, we're adjourned. <laughs>